Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back to the asteroid observation session. Uh, for those of you online, again, just as a reminder, you can follow along at the website www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop and also follow along on the hashtag find asteroids. Our next speaker is coming to us from Sporn, it's Jeffrey Mitchell. He'll be talking to us about a web portal for aggregating, disseminating, and standardizing observations. Jeffrey, over to you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jeff Mitchell, and I have a concept for an online research collaboration system. I envision this concept creating a highly interconnected network of researchers, volunteers, and facilities. My goal today is to enlist the help of observation domain experts in the final design phase of this system. By focusing on what's possible for such a system, I hope to inspire this engagement. Some of the system goals would be to facilitate communication, increase visibility of lines of research to the public and the observation research community, to remove barriers to participating in projects that would benefit from volunteers or even a wider base of professional researchers, to provide, a, uh, provide equipment coordination and computational support through interface and interoperability standardization, and use the power of a research network to uncover new, pro uh, to uncover new insights and relationships among projects. And facilitating communication would provide a, a single point of focus for a project status, quickly identify relationships between projects that, so that duplicate efforts can be identified, provide very detailed chronological records of events and discoveries, and allow a principal researcher to quickly promote the urgency of a given, uh, of a given task or sub-project to the project's network. We need efficient collaboration. We need to make sure that we reduce the onboarding work for a principal research team so that the volunteers' co contributions result in a net gain in productivity. Also, the most val val uh, valuable volunteers are most likely busy individuals as well, and the quicker they can become productive, the better. The system would create an efficient on-ramp so that forward progress of a project isn't hampered by the merging of new participants with the project. This would be by allowing for prospective uh, volunteers to watch and learn by before attempting to contribute. Uh, knowledge transfer to the project's network becomes a force multiplier for the researcher. Education and onboarding materials are continually improved by the network so that the network begins to take on the task associated with making new members productive. These next two areas are where I feel this system differentiates itself from content management systems or wikis, which are already being used to some degree to fulfill the first two goals, though not in the detail and volume I envision for this system. This next goal involves providing a gateway for data and numerical analysis, especially in cases where there may be no public gateway at all. JPL Horizons and the Minor Planet Center's web portal have great access, but I can guess that not all facilities having data relevant to an observation project or have available computational power uh, have this type of interface. So a simplified way to provide that should be beneficial. This will be done by providing a framework in which manual computations can be performed, commonly formatted, aggregated, and vetted by the research project's network participants, can harness the untapped computational powers of idle desktops or even idle data centers. One method might be internet scale clustering through message passing interfaces. Another method uh, would simply be grabbing a data set, doing some type of nu numerical analysis on that data set, and returning a uh, standardized result set. Provide project integration points or gateways to existing systems containing data that might be of use but otherwise has no public interface. This will be achieved partially through simple and standardized application programming interfaces or domain-specific languages. Graph databases represent an alternate way for a software system to persist data that uses attributes of data objects to create connections or paths to other data. It's widely used by social networking platforms to connect people, but I propose to use it to expose new connections among research, ideas, facilities, and discoveries. You're exposed to this technology daily. This technology is currently being used to create a profile of you based on things like what you normally, normally purchase and what you search for on the internet. These attributes are used to predict things like whether a credit card transaction is fraudulent or what ads to show you. It's one of my personal missions to use graph database technologies to a greater degree in scientific research. 
I like to use a software engineering technique that involves storyboarding. At a high level, this mimics the same process that scenes from a screenplay are laid out in a movie to lay out how a user will inter interact with this system. So far, what I've laid out are like props, locations, and actions that are available to us, perhaps. Now let's look at some attributes of a few of the people that might participate in such and such a system. They're called actors in this design methodology. Leveraging graph technology, these attributes would be how researchers will interact with, will intersect with volunteers and other professionals doing similar work and vice versa. So some of the attributes of a researcher might be uh, areas of specialization, current projects, primary focus, access to facilities, and past publications. A volunteer would also have a profile or a set of attributes being areas of interest, relevant skills, availability, and what is it, basically what their commitment level is, maybe a past hi history, and they may even have relevant equipment. The project is really the main character of this. It's not only, it's not exactly an actor, but it's the central focus of this system. Examples of a project might be orbital ca characterization of a near-Earth object or the development of a new technique or observation pattern. Here's some of the attributes that create the connection between the projects. It has a subject or series of subjects. It has participants. It has ever-growing content contribution from simple status posts to detailed con ca calculations and beyond. It has interfaces to necessary systems, and it likely descends from a broader or parent project. In closing, in the short time that I've had, I hope that I've given you enough of a picture of what's possible in such a system to generate some interest. I'll be happy to uh, expand further. In short, and in staying with the storyboarding principle I referenced earlier, I need help from leaders and experts in the observation field to build, a, build the detailed story points of this system. I'm Jeff Mitchell. Please contact me if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, any questions uh, in the room for uh, Jeff? Anyone? Nothing online? Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, if we thank could uh, move to the uh, next speaker, which is uh, Vadim uh, Semenyevich from the Kharkov uh, National University in Ukraine. Vadim, are, can you hear me? Vadim, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, can you uh, speak a little bit louder and closer to your microphone? You're you're a bit faint. No. Yeah, that's that's good. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. Ed. Okay, you can be hearing you too. Can we start now? Yes, please start. Yeah. Okay, okay. The topic of my presentation is software for providing asteroids, survey frames, state plan initiative, perspective. Operativeness is a key factor in discovery of NEA or PHA. Modern asteroid survey yields many frames during the night. A specialist will be unable to verify this promptly with uniform quality in the blinking mode. This obstacle is a challenging one for large aperture wide field vehicles, the field of field of which can include currently up to many dozens of point asteroids. To improve the operativeness, it is to create develop software for automated non automatic possession of asteroid survey frames. Presently, Colitex is solving the problem of frosted frames of current night asteroid surveys to detect asteroids automatically with subsequent visual confirmation of results. Colitex software executes, executes intra-frame for four satellites in a series and inter-frame for session of frames. The core of Colitex software consists in preliminary detection of objects based on accumulation of statistical proportional to the energy of signals along possible object motion path. Such accumulation is performed by, by multivariate transformation of coordinates of objects. Two-stage execution stabilizes computational 
over here at an acceptable level. <coughs> at the first stage, this transformation is equivalent to the Hoax transform. One can say that the program uses a two-stage space-time Hoax transform. The features of Qualitex software implementation allow to the possibility of effective application to many observatories worldwide. <coughs> the OLDS mod is especially significant. It allows for near real time data processing and time to many of the most interesting objects at the time of the preliminary discovery. Very slow and very fast objects. The very slow detection module allows covering, for example, the comet Iceton, which is a very popular today. Colitech visualizes its processing results. Colitech software equipped with the modern viewer of obtained results with a user friendly GUI. The viewer runs independently of the main program, it can be used for independent review of Qualitech operation results when the main program is producing data. A mobile version of the viewer is available. Qualitech operation results can be monitored from anywhere of the, in the world. All that is required is <coughs> any modern smartphones, a tablet or laptop running of any OS platform. After connecting to our web interface, you can perform different operations. For example, send a report to MPC, including quick report to NEOCP. When observing CA, the reaction time is critical. It can be increased by reducing the NEA discovery confirmation time. There is no need to wait for new observations. Often, it's sufficient to have information contained in public access ages. Rate automatic <coughs> extraction and protection of observation statement results from MPC. Publicly, publicly accessible to frame for different scopes. Providing a grant to use developer time. Calling developers can not appropriate software in a year without a grant. The same issue in several years. However, this software will be developed anyway, all through this poor quality. The first step in developing such system will involve frame storage and publication software, which has already been developed. The uh, first step in developing such system will involve frame and uh, storage publication software which has uh, already been developed. And this software allows maintaining a frame HF and searching for frames by specified parameters, coordinates. External access to the HF is provided via the own web interface and the Aladdin software. It allows even additional frames from, from the such external resources as SDSS and CMS. The software can be, has been implemented with the, with the use of VO technologies, including the Smart Image Access Protocol. Presently, Qualitech has been used in Ukraine H50 and Russia G00 H15. It's planned to use it, uh, <coughs> it's an amateur observatory in Spain and Australia. In 2013, Qualitech will start to be in Udisk and Krasnodar observatories. In 2014, the software may be used more extensively in amateur and professional laboratories provided, which have narrowed and wide telescopes. In May, over 1,300 limited discoveries of asteroids, including three in in roughly 400,000 observations during V3 called C-2010, X1 Elenium, T-2011, and O1 Elenium, T-2012, S1 Iceton were discovered among the five ones discovered in CIS in over 20 years. The distribution is discovered object by elliptic magnitude and orbital element shown in this slide, in, slide, in previous slides. <coughs> During 2011 and 2012, Qualitech was used in CIS and Baltic countries for making minimum 80% of observations and 75% of preliminary discoveries of asteroids. By the overall results of 2011 and 2012, 
observatory Aiston MM, equipped with 40 45 cm telescope and Colitech software, record 7 worldwide in both number of observa observations of asteroids and the number of their preliminary discoveries. The Colitech project is developed by Enthusiast. It has been supported for several years by such organizations as ISON, MAO, NASU, and RINSU. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Karim. Okay, do we have uh, any questions from anyone in the. This is uh, Benway Johnson at uh, NASA headquarters. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very, very interesting to know that uh, you and the ISON network has been very active in providing observations to the Minor Planet Center for the International Asteroid uh, Network. Um, the audio was a little bad on the presentation. I apologize for that. Uh, so that I understand, are you offering um, uh, these uh, software packages uh, t to be used by other observatories? Okay, very good. And they can contact you through your website, the neoastrosoft.com. Pardon, pardon, can you can repeat the question? Hey, Lindley, I don't think they can hear you. Repeat the question. Okay, let me try. Let me try again. Is the best way to contact you through your website, neoastrosoft.com? Yes, yes, there is the best way to contact us through, through the website. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Any questions around the room? Any questions online? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vadim. Thank you very much. If we could move to the um, next uh, topic, next speaker is Orly Lindgren from Entropy Limited. Uh, going to be talking about development of a high-performance information theory-based data mining tool for asteroid threat determination. Orly, if you're ready, go ahead. Hello, I'm ready. Can you can you hear and see? Yes, we can hear and see your presentation. Great. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm uh, presenting today on behalf of my colleagues with Entropy Limited, particularly Dr. Ronald Christensen, who is our founder and the uh, resident expert on information theoretic statistical data mining for us, and uh, a person who worked with us some 20 years ago when he was in physics at Harvard, uh, uh, Stephen Eikenberry, who um, got his Ph.D. in astronomy from, from Harvard and uh, went on to now uh, be a professor at uh, Florida, the University of Florida in astronomy. Uh, Dr. Christensen was very active in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, uh, and uh, he developed... Um, uh, studies of world developments in radio astronomy that now are cited as part of the National Radio Observatory Association's uh, a historical database. And uh, he did work at RAND that was classified. He finished his uh, education in uh, engineering at Caltech and uh, went on to Harvard to do work on space law. And uh, so we've been interested in these issues for a very long time. Most of the work we have done subsequently has been to apply operations research, information theoretic, uh, multivariate statistical analysis to prediction of difficult problems in a number of areas. Um, let's see if I can switch to the next slide. 
not quite sure how to do that, but let's see. Um, can somebody switch the slide for me? There we go. Uh, we believe that there are uh, challenges um, of uh, uncertainty and error, uh, certainly in near-Earth object uh, uh, asteroid threat characterization, identification characterization. Um, and uh, we um, have uh, uh, a belief uh, based upon discussions with, uh, with University of Florida and others that our methodology could be useful. Uh, and we are offering to, uh, to do research in conjunction with many others around the world uh, applying our entropy minimax pattern discovery method but moreover, we think it's timely to um, identify uh, on, a, on a world scale what are these main challenges of uncertainty and error, and what, um, what are some of the uh, information theoretic uh, statistical data mining methods that have been used uh, successfully so far to address some of those problems. And what are some of the challenges that remain? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Look forward to um, collaborating and uh, understanding what our tools and what these other tools can do uh, to help uh, model in a probabilistic way and classify asteroid pr uh, properties and predict their orbital elements from partial data and to help to validate the threat likelihood of Earth impacts. And we believe that there are many tools out there uh, in the NASA and other uh, National Science Foundations and Department of Energy sponsored programs, as well as the European and other countries sponsored programs, uh, that warrant demonstration. Let's go to the next slide. Now, some of the uh, simple things that our tools do and do routinely. Uh, in very uh, complex, large databases where we're dealing with uh, rare events and uh, have to struggle with uh, collinearity and nonlinearity and uh, missing data and so forth. We find missing data, fill the gaps with probabilistic estimates. We believe that some of those methods uh, could be useful uh, current, currently. Um, we do that uh, based upon understanding uh, uh, databases where there, there is not missing data and then controlling uh, uh, to develop the predictive modeling systems for filling in that data and, and then carefully keeping track of it so you can uh, account for what you filled in and go back and uh, monitor and change it. Uh, uh, the data distributions, we have through the years developed uh, analysis of uh, more than 100 non-normally distributed uh, 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 distributions and have specified, uh, developed, created algorithms and computer programs for uh, uh, estimating the parameters and computing the probabilities. We believe those, many of those will be relevant to the near-Earth object asteroid characterization problems that we're facing now and that our method of developing the data distribution um, uh, publications and software can be applied uh, in this field uh, with good uh, utility. Uh, finally, multivariate probabilities and uncertainties uh, is the area of handling nonlinearity and big data for modeling and rapidly estimating and finding rare outcomes. Uh, our software has been developed since the uh, 50s and the 60s where computing power was at a great premium. We have, through the years, uh, worked to make them run very, very fast on modern computers and believe that we could meet the challenge of very big, very fast data and that we some of the methods could be translated uh, into firmware that could be built in to some of the systems that need to deal very rapidly characterizing uncertainty and, and uh, making probabilistic uh, uh, estimates. Next slide, please. 
uh, we're actively fostering collaboration. We've, uh, we've discovered uh, many publications and many scientists working uh, throughout the U.S. and abroad. And uh, our multidisciplinary specialists would very much like to collaborate with NASA and these centers. But next slide. Let's run through these slides rather rapidly. Uh, we, are, we, we, we are working, uh, let's go on through, with FFRDCs for the National Science Foundation, DOE, DOD, DHS, and White House programs. Next slide, please. And various missions of NASA. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the university uh, affiliated research centers, particularly with, uh, with NASA Ames, uh, have been leaders in the development of these, uh, the, these data mining and, uh, and, and, uh, and other information theoretic type programs. <clears throat> and we have been in touch with some of their researchers and believe that their publications and their published software should be shared. Uh, next. Uh, let's go on. These are some of the uh, federally funded research and development programs have been leaders in the field who have uh, a very well trained uh, scientists and we have had some initial contact and believe that they are uh, many are um, ready to be collaborating. Next slide please. That's the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, uh, Fermi, Lawrence Berkeley, National Labs, uh, they've had many projects funded that deal with uncertainty and air detection and uh, um, uh, publicly available open source software that will, uh, we think, be beneficial and should be tested alongside ours. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Orly, you're uh, uh, running out of time. DOD and ready to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We have time for one really quick question, if there is one. Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Orly, very much. Thank you. Okay, our uh, next talk is by Clinton Clark, uh, Exo Analytic Solutions. Uh, he's going to be speaking about leveraging algorithms developed for Missile Defense Agency for automated NEA detection. Uh, good afternoon, everybody in Houston and also uh, around the world listening. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today and learn a little bit more about what we do and our capabilities for automated near-Earth asteroid detection and characterization. Over the past 15 years or so, we've developed our capabilities in support of U.S. Missile Defense Agency, Air Force, and Navy. And in support of those organizations, what we've done is develop the means to, in real time, detect, track, determine the orbit, characterize size, shape, material, et cetera, of man-made space objects from a variety of sensors, different cameras, different lenses, ground-based, airborne, space-based uh, sensors uh, for these customers in multiple bands. And recently, in, in the last few months, we've, uh, in response to this initiative, done internal testing and verify that these tools and techniques can be applied to the near-Earth asteroid mission, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So what do we do today? Currently, from our operations center in Manhattan Beach, California, we detect, track, and characterize near-Earth objects using our network of small telescopes, government assets that we do work on, and our eSpox software. And so you're seeing our software platform in the bottom left-hand corner. What it does in real time, it processes the focal plane, and then in addition to doing the work, it overlays that image on a simulated sky, so not only are we getting the answer, but we're viewing the results of that answer in the context of the full sky where the telescope is looking. And the only reason I showed the picture of this scope here, uh, this is actually our best piece of hardware. So we're not a hardware company. Uh, we are a software company. So when we talk about uh, science ready, I think somebody used a term earlier today and, the, and enabling amateur astronom astronomers to contribute. I mean, we're using amateur astronomer hardware with our own uh, re uh, software resources. So we've incorporated a number of key technologies into the eSpock software. I put this up here. We're not going to talk about each of these today. I'm actually just going to transition to the next side, slide and walk you through what happens in real time. And when I say in real time, 
Uh, think of frame rates on the order of 1,000 hertz as being the upper limit of speed where we could go. Let me describe to you what happens when we go out with our telescopes and look at the sky. So we take an image. That image comes off the, off the camera into our computer. In real time, the image is processed. All the sources of light are identified. It trains itself on the fly to decide what is a star. And all those stars are fed into a billion star uh, star catalog that we built for the MDA. It uses that catalog to do real-time image registration and calibration. And just for your awareness, we register to about one micro radian of accuracy, and we calibrate brightness within about 0.1 visual magnitudes. The next step that happens is all non-star sources of light are adjudicated with our dim object detection uh, technology. And just as a point of reference, with the 16-inch scope that I showed you on the previous slide and about a 10-second integration time, we can get to 20th magnitude objects uh, in the skies where, where we have telescopes. Once that is done, we sort, we look at all those pieces of light again. We use our closely spaced object detection algorithm to determine are each of these non-star sources of light one or more object. And once we've made our decision and our accuracy there is about if objects are separated by a half a pixel or more, and one object is at least 1 20th the brightness of the other, we can tell them apart and maintain separate track on both. That all happens that fast. What follows then is we maintain independent track on each of those objects on the focal plane, grab their astrometrics and their radiometrics in real time and feed those into orbit determination or orbit updating processes or into object characterization processes, whether we want to do tumble rate or size or shape or material, whatever, depending on the bands that we're collecting in. So that's what feeds our signature and feature extraction uh, line, and then it goes into target characterization and, and uh, track updates. And then we maintain our own high accuracy catalog for the objects that we maintain and track. So when we go back, we can verify if there have been any changes based on photometry or if the orbit has changed significantly from the last time we've gone out. So every good astronomer presentation needs an eye chart. This is mine. All it has really are more detailed descriptions of some of the key algorithms as well as performance statistics on some of the algorithms. But what I really wanted to show you was some key results. Uh, it looks like we're missing a slide. OK, well, we won't show this one. I'll just move to the next one. Um, I had a video with a wide field of view on the previous slide. where We had a 30-second video where we tracked 14 objects simultaneously. I just wanted you to see what would happen uh, with the real time. Uh, no, that's not it, but that's okay. Uh, we'll give it a shot. No, it's not playing, and that's okay. No worries. So what I would have shown you on the previous was a, it was a two by two field of view, a 30 second video where we were capturing uh, 14 objects as they flew through and show you that we were simultaneously pulling off the metric information that we could then feed into our orbit determination software and the photometry. In this case, we were using a visible band and we were cl actually calculating the tumble rates on the fly. In, in lieu of that, I'll show you this Delta IV uh, example. There's a raw focal plane. We're looking up at the Milky Way. And I promise you there's a tumbling Delta IV rocket body in view. And this, the challenge with this object is, is similar to the NEO problem. Uh, you have to watch long enough that you can tell the objects apart from a star. And in this case, the Delta IV has a very similar streak length and very similar streak angle uh, to the stars in the field of view, and it becomes very, very challenging for the human eye to pick this out. What I'm going to do now is I'm not, I've already run this through, so I know what the answer is. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and give you guys a little help and overlay the simulated sky behind the image. So now what I've done is in behind are all the simulated stars. Not all of them, up to about magnitude 14. We don't need them all because we're looking in the Milky Way. We just blot out the image. But also right there in the center is a simulated delta IV. So using the spacetrack.org TLE, that's where that object should be located, and that green streak is the streak length and streak angle of the object we should be looking for. Now the question is, where is that streak? And if I go one more, process this. This is the fully processed frame. So what happened, as soon as that image was taken, that quickly, all of the stars were identified, circled, uh, and we had a white box put around them. Those were fed into our registration and calibration uh, processes so that we could overlay that frame on the simulated sky. It also, in real time, identified that streak as a delta IV. Now we watched this object for a few minutes. In this case, we were staring, so the stars are streaking through. We watched it for a few minutes. You'll notice it's about 25 kilometers from where it's supposed to be. So in the few minutes that we watched this, we updated its orbit track, pulled its photometry, and calculated its tumble rate. 
Uh, this isn't the full string here, but just to give you an example of what we were doing. So we do this routinely, and the core of our mission is to look at man-made things, but as I said, recently we've looked at can we do this for near-Earth asteroids. And so the next example is one where we've done that. So this is a, a processed focal plane. So we've, I've taken the picture, I've flagged it, I've tracked all the stars in view. So I've put boxes around them so I know where I'm looking. And in here there is a, actually there are two asteroids, I'll just show you one. So I went ahead, I'm going to go ahead and throw the simulated stars behind it to help you out. So now you can see that the streaks overlay the stars, the simulated stars over this intro to those streaks. But hiding here in the bottom is Ceres. And I, I chose this one. We've done a few dozen uh, to confirm that the software does what we expect. I picked Ceres because it's my favorite because it's big and it's got, a, it's got a nice little history about it. Uh, actually, there's one up here that's undocumented. We, we put question marks by it when we look at it. So we haven't gone back to the Minor Planet Center to verify uh, what that is. But again, it was an uncued detection. So the idea that I wanted to show you here is we do this all the time for man-made space objects. We go up, we find them, we track them, we update their orbits, we characterize them using multiple band photometrics and radiometrics. The same technology can be applied to near-Earth asteroids. And in this case, if we watched this for much longer, we would have been able to generate an orbit from scratch or update an orbit from the Minor Planet Center and then pull its photometry or its radiometrics if we'd have been in uh, different bands. Again, this is back to that presentation slummery. Real-time dim object detection, tracking, orbit determination, real-time characterization from multiple bands. We don't care about the sensor. So if you want to use the best of the best from the Air Force, and in fact, we've done some, some work on Air Force sensors, very high quality, you can do great work with it. If you want to, you go all the way down to the low end of the, of the technology food chain and, and enable amateur astronomers. We've done that as well. In fact, we've gone down uh, to commercial camera lenses and been able to, to find space objects with that. Uh, so in terms of enabling astronomers, we think that's a, this is a great opportunity as well. And then the last thing is, uh, because of the speed, we can go back and process historic data uh, and, and generate a catalog from images that have already been taken and build that up and then use that to queue subsequent uh, searches. So with that, I'll take questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, quick, just one moment. Questions from the room? Hello? Okay. Um, I'm familiar with the UCAC4. Can you share some of the um, stats about your reference catalog? So we use a catalog called PPXML. It's a combination of two star databases that I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, there are a billion stars in it. It's uh, visible multiple IR bands and UV. So it's, it, it allows extremely uh, high accurate uh, registration. I, I saw two more. Uh, yeah, um, just a, a kind of a few questions. Who funds your work now? Because it clearly is well funded. Uh, number two, how do you open this up beyond one click citizen science? Is there, is there a way to do that? Because right now it seems, um, well, is, is, do you have any plans or any thoughts on that? And then number three, sure. what other problems are you working towards? What, what's your future look like? Because this is all your present, current work. Yes. Do you, do you have, what, are, what are the big problems you're working on right now? So I'm going to try to work through those. You may keep the mic close to them in case I forget. So the first one, who's funding it? No one is funding the software to go after near-Earth asteroids or space debris. And we get very little funding for space objects. So much, much of what you saw is IRAD and it's historic stuff built on SBIRs for, for those organizations for very specific missions. And what we've done here is organize it into a, a full suite to make it science ready to use somebody's word from earlier today to close the loop on that. Where we've been focusing, uh, I think I'm skipping to your third question, where we have been focusing mainly lately is how using the software to enable us to go down the food chain in hardware cost. So we're to the point of CHEF testing the absolute least expensive camera, absolute least expensive lenses to see how far down we can go and still be effective in various missions. And so what we, we've done a huge trade study on uh, every camera and scope combination, what field of view that generates versus the minimum detectable magnitude versus our software, which, we, which operates at near optimal uh, the, the capability in terms of detections of dim objects versus the noise. Uh, so we, that's kind of been our focus is how far down can we push that uh, our pedigree has been in finding them extremely fast. That was where we got our start, and now it's can we find them extremely fast with minimal cost. And then what that allows us to do is to enable sort of a greater reach of contributors to the mission because 
the further down the food chain we can go, then we can leverage the hardware that anim amateurs have. And just take, if we have time tagged imagery, for example, that's all I need to go and hunt for asteroids. Okay, we need to move on really yep. quickly. Uh, one question here, but before, there's a question from online uh, for you. Are you working primarily with telescope data, if so which, or satellite imagery? So primarily telescopes. Uh, so in terms of the which, maybe I'll, I'll tie it back to this question. So the farthest down the food chain we've gone, that is a telescope, would be like a four and a half inch Celestron, okay. like a 380, an ATIC 383L plus. So, so basic amateur, entry level amateur stuff, all the way up to processing uh, something from uh, space based space surveillance uh, platform uh, okay. from Boeing. So that, that is kind of the spectrum of tools that we've processed it on. Okay, really, really quick. Yeah. Yeah, it, it'd be better if but we do have time at the end for uh, discussion. So we'll save that question, uh, Clinton. You're going to be around for the discussion. Absolutely. So, so we'll say that. So let's move on. The next uh, speaker is uh, Sarah Case from AI Solutions Incorporated. She's going to be speaking to us about a free flyer software for asteroid observation and mission design. So Sarah, when you are ready. Okay, thank you very much. I am here to talk about uh, free flyer software, which is developed by my company, AI Solutions, and how it can be used for the asteroid observation problem, as well as the uh, asteroid redirect mission design. Um, and really just want to promote awareness of our software um, and into the asteroid uh, uh, world. Uh, so for those who have no awareness at all of FreeFlyer, it's a commercial off-the-shelf software tool for spacecraft mission design, analysis and, analysis, and operations, so all the way from the beginning through the end of uh, spacecraft mission life cycle. And it's been used for the last 16 years at uh, various NASA centers, military organizations, as well as commercial and international organizations. Um, so the NASA centers where FreeFlyer is used predominantly are uh, the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, as well as Goddard, Kennedy, and Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, FreeFlyer has been used to support missions in a variety of orbit regimes from LEO to GEO, as well as uh, some of the more deep space missions, uh, Earth Moon, I'm sorry, Earth Sun L1, some analysis for Earth Sun L2, um, heliocentric missions, as well as uh, lo lunar orbiters, and some uh, analysis for asteroid missions. And especially since we're here in Houston, I want to bring attention to the fact that FreeFlyer has been selected to replace all of the flight dynamics functionality for the Mission Control Center for the International Space Station. So FreeFlyer will be providing all of the uh, mission planning for ISS going forward, as well as future vehicles that are operated out of Houston, such as MPCV. Um, some of the key FreeFlyer features that are useful to know about, I'm sorry, are, um, uh, of course, propagation, spacecraft <coughs> propagation and trajectory design, maneuver planning, coverage and contact analysis, um, attitude modeling, um, orbit determination, and interplanetary navigation. Uh, the image that's shown here shows an example of a, a hyperbolic flyby of Mars, and then visualizing the orbit plane, the incoming asymptote uh, B plane, some of the key uh, directions that are involved in that analysis. Um, so it's really a combination of a visualization tool as well as a very high fidelity um, analysis tool. And um, at the bottom, we, we, we want to note in particular the software is very flexible and very scalable. Um, it incorporates its own scripting language, and so there's really no limit to the logic uh, that you can implement to have a very customized scenario play out in uh, your simulation. For asteroid observation in particular, um, FreeFlyer um, has the ability to process ground and space-based observations in order to perform orbit determination. Um, in FreeFlyer, you can implement anything from an initial orbit determination to Batchley squares, and we also have two different uh, formulations of a Kalman filter. And those can be used in any combination. So you could do uh, first an initial OD, then a batch <coughs> process, then a Kalman filtering process. Um, in sequence, or you could perhaps have those running in parallel if you wanted to compare the results 
between uh, more than one of these different estimators. And then with each of those estimation processes, you can estimate position, velocity, coefficient of reflectivity, and also any accelerations that aren't already modeled in your force model that might be acting on the body. And you can estimate an unlimited number of objects concurrently, whether that's one spacecraft or asteroid, or 10, or 100, or 1,000. There's no limit in our software for that. And then moving down towards the bottom half of this slide, um, once the orbit has been estimated and you want to predict forward to when is this object going to be visible from different observation sites, um, again, you can do observations, uh, predictions from ground and space-based assets. And you can uh, constrain those predicted contact times based on the field of view of your sensor, the range to the object, the size of the object, as well as the uh, lighting conditions. You can implement any custom logic, again, to filter objects down by orbit or rotation rate. And you can generate, once you have some information about uh, the size, the attitude state of your object, you can visualize them and create uh, predicted views from any sensor. Um, again, this tool can be used throughout the asteroid mission life cycle. And so once we get into the uh, actual redirection portion of the mission, this tool can still be applied in that uh, part of the mission as well. Um, FreeFlyer will then allow you to model the spacecraft orbit to go and redirect the asteroid and also the crewed vehicle to rendezvous with the asteroid. Um, with FreeFlyer, you can model the gravity from any planet or any other body that you want to specify using either a spherical uh, harmonic gravity expansion or polyhedral gravity, with polyhedral gravity, which is gravity modeling, which is what I'm showing in the top image here. And then you can also model other forces, solar radiation pressure, solid tides, ocean tides, albedo, et cetera. Um, those can actually be implemented. Even if it's not built in, you can specify custom forces to add into your spacecraft's force model into the integration process. And then again, it, once you have your environment model set up, you can do your mission design and trade studies, um, whether you want to do um, uh, impulsive or finite mo maneuver modeling, chemical or electrical propulsion modeling, um, basically to, to analyze the entire mission life cycle and determine delta V, fuel usage, time of flight uh, to go and do the entire mission for any candidate asteroid. And you could run this for multiple asteroid candidates in order to, to determine your, your best candidate. In summary, I wanted to again reiterate that FreeFlyer can be used throughout the mission life cycle. And again, since it's already in use at various NASA centers, including JSC, using FreeFlyer for the asteroid redirect mission will be a natural progression for NASA here in Houston. And any other organizations that adopt FreeFlyer or start to learn about it will then have access to the same models and interfaces that are used by NASA. And having that standardized tool available across the organization really just saves time and effort, prevents duplication of work. And so if anybody is interested, I'd very much encourage you, you can, of course, go to the freeflyer.com website. You can ask me any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Any questions from anyone in the room? OK. I actually did have one. Have you uh, thought about using this with uh, real asteroid data yet? Um, in terms of what, you, what are your plans just for a proof of concept? Um, so we have done some analysis with Goddard related to OSIRIS-REx uh, for the mission planning for that. Um, but now as far as the asteroid observation problem, we haven't uh, started down that path yet. Okay. Good. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mo let's move to the uh, last presentation in this uh, section. Uh, Tom Burleson from uh, Rice Engineering. Uh, talking about geometric nonlinear signal processing algorithm to enhance range performance of NASA radars for tracking asteroids. And uh, Tom, whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. Uh, I am not the planned presenter. The planned presenter is having some difficulty in Huntsville. He was going to do this virtually. However, what we have is a geometric nonlinear signal processor, or GINLISP, and we've developed this algorithm to reduce the, uh, well, reduce isn't the right word. 
we were we were developing it for uh, Department of Defense applications to increase either the radar range or the size of the radar objects they could detect with their phased array radars. It is applicable to asteroid hunting and characterization. It obviously has a missile defense application and there are some other things that we're not at liberty to talk about. The uh, linear algorithm currently used by most uh, radars, most modern phased array radars, have thousands of, of transmit and receive elements. They take those transmit and receive elements in various subarrays. They take the subarray outputs and combine those in a linear fashion to get the estimate of the radar position, of the, excuse me, the target position. What we have is an algorithm which will take a nonlinear process to do that same activity. It will increase the radar performance by about double. In our sample calculations, we used outputs from these subarrays and our special a geometric expansion of the data added an averaging process. The actual process is a, uh, I'm not going to discuss it at this point. It's a, it's a, uh, what's, what's the word I want? <laughs> it's a company secret. <laughs> it's proprietary, right. Essentially what you can do, if you look at the upper half of this radar phase ray radar beam, you can see something with a linear process that has been detected at a certain range. With our nonlinear process, GenLisp, you can detect something much smaller at the same range or approximately double the range of the radar. This is not done with magic. We've done computer experiments to show how the, how the algorithm applies to radar data. Uh, we've done numerous trials, thousands of samples each, with a simulated signal plus noise. If you look at the linear results, using a linear algorithm, you get a nice bell-shaped curve, and right there in the middle you see the, the assumed position of the object being tracked. The same data processed with our nonlinear process uh, comes up with a much narrower curve. The important thing to look at is the horizontal curve, the horizontal uh, axis there. It's a two orders of magnitude larger scale. If you look at on the same scale, you went from that kind of a response to this. You get a much more accurate resolution of the radar track. Standard deviations after the processing for linear was about 0.11. With the GenList process, it was much smaller. That's a 240-time improvement in accuracy. Calculation of the range improvement was tempered by R4 losses, and we can approximately double the radar range with the uh, radar which we were simulating at that point. Uh, this 240 times improvement in uh, in radar accuracy versus range, two times improvement in radar range, they're actually similar kinds of numbers. In the radar world, we look at 240 times the radar cross section, which is approximately 15 or 16 times the actual radius. If you look at doubling the range, that requires approximately six time, 16 times the power. So we're looking at a 16 times kind of a thing, either doubling the range or 240 times smaller in radar cross-section. We can resolve smaller objects. We can resolve smaller objects on a larger asteroid. You can do this in both ordinary observations and in synthetic aperture mode. We can apply GenList processes to the NASA radar data. We can also, we can increase the effective detection range or we can improve the detection of smaller asteroids. Looking at some of the uh, abstracts which were presented earlier, we believe we can also apply this to the laser, laser radar, which are proposed in, in a couple of others. So future plans, uh, we, we need to have some NASA radar data to apply this on to show that it works in the real world. We have advanced algorithms under investigation, which seem to work when you have a 
fairly good signal to noise ratio. And we look forward to further discussions either with NASA or with other interested parties. Contact information. Dr. Robert Carruth is the principal investigator for this item. Uh, that's a telephone number of Rice Engineers and an email if you care to call us, if you care to email us. And questions. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone, please. So uh, we're going to take questions from the room first, and then uh, online. Is that, this is Lindley. Um, have, I'm looking for a government agency that uh, we could uh, um, talk with uh, about you. Uh, from your location, I assume maybe you've done work with uh, MDA. We have made several proposals to MDA. Uh, we don't actually have a contract with MDA at this point. Okay. Um, so there has not been any real-world testing of these algorithms yet? Not with actual radar data. What we've, always, what we've done so far has been with simulated radar data, yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. So just real quick, are you familiar with the Doppler range approach that JPL uses in its r radar observations? Yes, we are, and Dr. Cruz and assures me that he believes this is applicable to the Doppler radar world as well. Okay. Okay, over here. You may not be the right person to ask, but you know, what are the distances we're talking about for an, an active system like radar? What, how far out can you reach? Okay. This is actually a process which you apply to an existing radar. It's not a radar system in itself. It's, it's a procedure that you apply to the radar data and that allows you to double the range that you currently have with the radar that you're using. So, so Doppler range radar is limited by bandwidth. You mentioned power. What effect does it have on the bandwidth requirement for a Doppler range radar? Okay, you've, uh, you've exceeded my capability to answer questions <laughs> at this point. So if you give me your card, I'll share it with colleagues at JPL. All right, if you'll contact Dr. Carruth at this particular Email address. I'm sure he can answer that. Okay. Any other uh, questions from the room or online? We have uh, we have one uh, a couple of questions that came out online. We won't get to all of them right away. We will have time in the afternoon discussion session. Um, but I would like uh, Paul to answer one of the uh, questions related that uh, came in regarding a, a comment. So if you could repeat the question, Paul. Uh, yes, a question from Ustreamer three seven four four nine seven. Comets can also pose a threat, but they have different orbital characteristics than asteroids. Do any of these prediction methods incorporate trajectories for comets? So that may have been uh, a question for an earlier uh, presenter. Um, so yeah, let, let me answer that. Um, the, I'm sure the, uh, the the trouble or the difficulty with comets is that they are usually in, in um, uh, much more eccentric orbits and therefore traveling at higher velocity. I'm sorry? Or from Orly Lindgren. Oh, that was for Orly no, Lindgren? it was from him. Oh, from? It was for him. Oh, for him? Oh, for him. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So Go I guess. Go ahead. You can answer. Uh, we should let Orly answer that. This is a question for Orly. Is Orly in the audience? He's on, he's on the phone, but you can answer. Go ahead, answer it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do believe, yes, exactly the same. Uh, um, Methods approach uh, can be applied to comets. The orbits are a little bit different. The comets are approaching um, at higher velocities, but the uh, but the exact same techniques can be used. And radar is 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 used to observe um, comets as just as they are used to observe asteroids. Okay, great. Well, with that, let's um, conclude our session. Thank you very much to all our speakers. We'll take a break for uh, ten minutes. Uh, we will um, come back at uh, three forty-five. Three forty-five pick up the next okay. talk.